Hi everyone, I'm Duncan Hill from the Modern Arm Brewster, and I'm here today to talk about this historical uh, reproduction crossbow that I designed and built. Uh, this is based on a uh, German example um, that was used uh, from the late 15th century right up uh, through the 19th century. Um, it was a sporting crossbow called a Rustung, which translates literally to weapon. Um, the crossbow was used for uh, hunting and for target shooting as well. Um, this reproduction uh, varies from the originals in a few aspects. So number one, the prod that I'm using is a lightweight aluminum prod. The draw weight is only about 75 pounds or so, which is ideal to be able to span it by hand um, and makes it a bit safer to use. Um, the originals would have a heavy steel prod with draw weights in excess of 1,000 pounds. Uh, secondly, the nut I'm using here is a tough plastic called Delrin, and originally that would have been actually antler um, with some steel reinforcements. The bolt clip here is PVC, um, however the originals would have used uh, animal horn. Um, sometimes you would see those uh, later on replaced by brass or even steel. The locking mechanism that I'm using is a fairly simple two-axle uh, locking system. Whereas in the originals, it was a very complex four axle uh, locking system. And finally, the decorations that I've used here um, is curly maple for the veneers on the top and bottom, and also the same curly maple for the, uh, the dot inlays on the sides. Um, the originals would have used bone, ivory, or even mother of pearl for uh, the decorations, and the decorations would have been much, much more elaborate than on this one. Um, so th those are some of the key differences between this and the original. However, the uh, design elements, the measurements, the proportions are all very, very similar to the original. So we'll walk you through that now. So here at the front of the bow, as I mentioned, we've got the prod, which is aluminum. The originals would have used that heavy steel that I was talking about. Um, the type of crossbow that this evolved from were military crossbows used in the Middle Ages um, that actually used uh, horn composite prods, um, again with very high draw weights, and these prods were made out of a combination of animal horn, sinew, sometimes whale baleen, and wrapped um, often in birch bark. Um, so these prods were powerful, but they were very susceptible to changes in weather, moisture, and temperature, and so on, which would affect the performance um, of the prod. So around the late uh, 14th, early 15th century, we saw steel prods start to come in as metallurgy technology advanced, and specifically the ability to um, harden and temper steel. So the original uh, military crossbows, the tillers would be a little bit longer. Um, on rustungs, they were typically anywhere between 600 millimeters and 800 millimeters, whereas the um, the horn the horn bow uh, crossbows, the military crossbows, would sometimes be up to a meter in length for the stock. Um, additionally, the form of the stock was very very similar from the front to about the lock, and then towards the end they would taper out gradually to get quite thin towards the end of the stock. Whereas in the rust tongue, what we saw um, towards, again, towards the end of the 15th century is when the rust tongues came into being, they had a cheek piece um, for a right-handed shooter that would be on the left-hand rear of the stock. And this was essentially a hollowed out concave part of the stock which would rest very comfortably against the cheek of the shooter. Um, this was in lieu of a shoulder stock which really wasn't in existence at that point. Part of the reason being is uh, there really wasn't a lot of recoil in crossbows. Certainly with heavier draw weights, you get a little bit of a kick, but nothing like a firearm, and hence they just never used uh, shoulder um, shoulder stocks. So moving towards the very front of the crossbow, we see the suspension ring. And the suspension ring actually took the place of uh, the previous stirrup. Now the stirrups in those military crossbows were there to aid in spanning, where the crossbowman could place his foot and press down using the muscles in his legs and back in order to span the crossbow. Whereas uh, with this type of crossbow, they were spanned largely with 
a, a crank called a craniquin. And given that they are fairly small, um, they could be comfortably held in the hand while the crank was applied, so there really was no more need for a stirrup. So instead we have a suspension ring, which is simply there for storage. So when the crossbow is not in use, it could be hung on the wall, and it itself is a nice decoration, given the lavish uh, decoration of the, of the stocks um, that was very common. Uh, Another thing I'd like to point out is the binding here. Now, the binding on this particular reproduction is exactly uh, the way that the binding was done on the historical uh, Rustung crossbows, which is um, about eight meters of hemp cord, which is wrapped through a hole in the stock and around the front, around this binding block. And this block is here to protect the binding uh, from the violent vibrations uh, in the prod when it shoots. So it's wrapped through and through, and then the loose ends of the cord are then wrapped around themselves, around those bundles of bindings that really tightens the whole system up and makes a very, very secure, tight binding. And finally, that binding would be painted uh, with melted beeswax, which helps to ward off uh, moisture and just keep everything together, together and keep the ends from unraveling. Of course, I need to mention here the, uh, the pom-poms. Um, there really is not any information about pom-poms as such in the scholarship, in the literature. However, um, it seems to me that these are largely for decoration. I have seen some people speculate that perhaps they were there to dampen vibrations or reduce the sound. I can tell you from my own testing and experiences, it has no effect on the sound, has no effect on the performance of the crossbow whatsoever. I really think they were just decoration. Um, I also suspect that the colors that were chosen for the pom-poms probably related to the crossbow shooter's guild or city. Um, I have absolutely no basis uh, for that, but that's just my gut instinct. Uh, so moving to the top of the, uh, the tiller, you'll see the uh, bolt rest here at the front. And this was something that was very specific to central European crossbows, German crossbows. Um, and this differed from Western European crossbows like that were made in Spain, England, and um, Belgium. Those particular crossbows used a groove between the nut and the front that would guide the bolt when it was shot. However, these German crossbows used this bolt rest, and that would help to reduce the friction between the bolt and the top of the tiller. And it could also be adjusted left and right for windage. Um, we actually would see these bolts on the medieval uh, German crossbows as well. However, in those cases, they were typically integral with the top bone veneer, so they'd be carved right into the veneer. So in those cases, they were not adjustable. Uh, one other thing I'd like to point out about the prod is that you'll see here the safety cord on the front. Um, this was on every single rust on crossbow that you can see in museums and so on. Um, they were always there, and that is, again, because the, these heavy steel prods were prone to breakage, which also relates to why the draw lengths of these uh, historical originals were quite a bit smaller than this. So this is about 8.5 inches, whereas the historical originals would have 6 or sometimes even 5 inches. And that's simply because the heavy steel prods really could not be reliably bent that far back and avoid breakage. So that's why the power stroke was limited, which in turn um, explains why the draw weights were so high, because you wanted to have enough weight behind it that you could still have the power and the velocity in the projectile uh, when shooting the crossbow, because you had less uh, distance in the power stroke to accelerate uh, the projectile. So the safety cord there, in the event that the steel prod would break, um, the safety cord was there to contain any bits of flying shrapnel and to dissipate the energy, and um, that was all that was needed. It doesn't seem like much. It's just a piece of braided hemp cord, but um, evidently that was enough uh, to, to prevent serious injury or even death in the event of uh, a prod breakage. So moving forward along the, uh, the tiller now, we come to the lock. And as I mentioned previously, I'm using uh, Delrin, this plastic, uh, for the nut here, and I've got it reinforced uh, through the fingers with steel pins, and that's exactly what the originals would have in the antler nut, with steel pins through these fingers. And that should be obvious, because with these high draw weights that I referred to, um, these two fingers were the only thing holding back that thousand plus pounds. So of course they needed these steel pins through the fingers to uh, reinforce that. In addition, 
<clears throat> if we rotate the nut around, you'll see this is the notch that engages with the lever that's inside the body of the crossbow, which keeps it from turning until you press the trigger. And where it engages, you see the steel sear. Um, the originals would also have that. They typically use more of a wedge-shaped um, piece of steel, uh, and that just prevents wear and tear on the nut, so it would last a lot longer. The uh, wood surrounding the nut is called the lager, and that's essentially a wooden seat um, that has the rounded notch um, for, the, for the nut, and it holds it very, very securely um, to the point where you don't actually need any kind of axle or anything in there. It's simply enough uh, to have this precisely carved um, notch um, for, for the nut. Um, the originals would also have a bone plate inside the front and the back, and that prevents the wood from compressing underneath those enormous um, pressures. So even though you didn't need um, any kind of axle to restrain this because it doesn't take any load, in fact, you would see that in later uh, Flemish target crossbows, sometimes they just would not have any kind of axle at all, and you could freely take the nut in and out. Similar to Italian target crossbows today, um, they are not secured. However, um, what can sometimes happen is when you shoot, the nut can actually jump out after the shot um, as it's spinning. So in order to prevent that, you would have this um, cordage here called a nusfaden, which translates to nut thread, which was simply there to keep it from jumping out after the shot. Uh, finally, we've got the bolt clip here, and that's simply to hold the bolt securely to the deck um, so that it won't fall out if you're in the bush hunting or just handling the crossbow um, during a target shooting competition. As I mentioned before, these were typically made out of animal horn. This one is PVC. So moving further back along the stock, we come to the trigger guard here. Now you'll notice that the, this trigger guard looks very, very much like the trigger levers that were ubiquitous across crossbows um, during the Middle Ages. You would have one trigger lever, just like this, that would go up with one axle, and then the front of the trigger lever would engage with the nut, and then obviously when you press pull it the, uh, the lever upwards, it releases the nut and fires. On rust-on crossbows, they did not use that kind of uh, locking system. It was a multi-axle uh, lock system. Um, this is a two-axle lock system. This is simply a trigger guard. It has no, no function other than to keep the trigger from being accidentally hit. The reason why I think they retained this shape is because the single axle trigger lever was such a ubiquitous design, um, I really think it became part of the iconography of crossbows. And indeed, if you look at old um, paintings and illustrations and so on, um, you'll always see this. So I think um, they, when they were designing and developing rust on crossbows, they just wanted to carry that shape forward. And it was really only until the end of the 17th or early 18th century that we saw this disappear. Um, when light sporting crossbows called schneppers uh, started being developed. And then the trigger guard that they used looked a lot more like a, a conventional um, rifle's trigger guard. Um, <clears throat> so along those lines, uh, in terms of the developments of this form, I mentioned before the cheek piece. The cheek piece was really an evolution from that original medieval design at the, the back of the butt. And... As time went on, we saw this become much more, more and more pronounced until eventually it became almost like a separate piece of wood that sort of um, came out from the side of the uh, the stock, um, which eventually was sort of adopted from firearms, which in turn, previously, firearms adopted some of their formal elements for crossbows from crossbows. So it was a very interesting give and take uh, in that respect. So that is the rustung. Uh, I hope you found this video very interesting and informative, and thank you very much to Jack and Historical Archery for hosting the video. If you haven't subscribed to his channel already, please do. It's got loads of amazing content, really interesting content. Um, if you're interested in finding out more about this crossbow or other crossbows that I make through the Modern Arm Brewster, please check out my website and my Instagram. The links are on the screen and below. And thank you very much.